Hello and welcome to week 5's lecture. In today's session, we will be looking closely at chapters 4 to 6, uh, which are from book 1. In the previous sessions, we saw how Dickens had condensed a lot of themes in the first uh, couple of chapters. And uh, today we will be looking at some of the key incidents which will set the narrative ball rolling. In this uh, chapter, in chapter 4, we are introduced uh, once again to Mr. Jarvis Laurie, a banker whom we first saw in the first few chapters. And we get a good set of description about his uh, physical uh, personality as well as his mental makeup. This is what the third person narrator has to say about Mr. Jarvis Laurie, the banker from Telson and Co. The narrator says, a face habitually suppressed and quieted was still lighted up under the quaint wig by a pair of moist bright eyes that it must have cost their owner in years gone by some pains to drill to the composed and reserved expression of Telson's bank. A quick reading of this excerpt tells us that there is a symbolic connection between Telson's bank and the employee of that bank, Mr. Jarvis Laurie. Now let's take this excerpt very slowly and uh, see what are the qualities that we can elicit, get about Mr. Laurie. Here we see that his face is constantly suppressed. It's a very interesting choice of word and quieted. There's a sedate uh, impression about Mr. Jarvis Laurie and it is something that he has got through years of experience. Though he is very serene, uh, sedate and quiet, uh, he is still uh, possessing that quality of uh, spiritedness. There is still some light about him and that is indicated by a pair of moist bright eyes. Therein lies the emotion uh, with regard to this man, Mr. Laurie. So it is the eyes that reveal that sentiment, that emotion in his person. And uh, the narrator further says that it has not been easy for Mr. Laurie to come up with this kind of serene attitude about him. Uh, he guesses that it must have cost this man um, a lot to uh, kind of compose himself, to train himself uh, to produce this reserved expression. And this reserved expression is significant because that is the attitude, um, the perception that Telson's bank wants to convey to its customers. There is nothing uh, connected to emotion impulse about the bank. It is full of business. So the point that we must take away from this excerpt is that uh, Mr. Laurie personifies the principles associated with Telson's bank, which have offices both in London and in Paris. Uh, this description about Mr. Laurie is uh, discussed uh, in the context of the hotel as a setting in this particular novel. That's something we need to remember because uh, at this hotel we'll have uh, Miss Minette who is coming by to uh, visit Mr. Laurie and they too are going to embark on a journey which will recover somebody important for this novel. Miss Minette, as I said uh, just now, is going to visit uh, Mr. Laurie. She has just arrived at the hotel called George and she uh, is um, asked, she has asked permission to meet this uh, um, gentleman. And when they meet, uh, Mr. Laurie notices that she is a short, slight, pretty figure, a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes, 
that met his own with an inquiring look and a forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of lifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity or of wonder or alarm or merely a bright fixed attention, though it included all four expressions. This description of Miss Minette um, has some connection with the description of Mr. Jarvis Laurie in one uh, particular aspect which is uh, the color of the eyes. Um, a pair of blue eyes um, is something that Miss Minette and Mr. Laurie have in common. We can also assume that this is quite a, a British trait and which is also associated with something benign, not evil, not evil. Uh, I would like you to pay attention to the color of the eyes because when you come to take a look at some of the other characters in Paris and uh, in the countryside uh, of France, you will notice that certain characters have dark eyes and dark eyes symbolize darkness, um, the element of evil within them. So, which is why I am pointing out this aspect of Miss Minette and Mr. Laurie's description. So, she is very, very slight, she is very slim, she is short, she is pretty, the ideal of uh, what is considered to be beauty uh, in those days um, in the Victorian period as well as in the late 18th century. And she has a quantity, a good amount of golden hair. Golden color is also very uh, significant in this novel because once again gold is um, associated with uh, benign aspects of uh, life, something that is good and not evil. Uh, again, please make a, a contrast between the color of the hair of Miss Minette as well as the other central female character, uh, Madame Defarge and um, notice what sort of uh, hair she has, what kind of color of hair uh, does she possess because that will tell you about the uh, contrast that Dickens is trying to strike between these two central female characters. So, this lady, this uh, uh, girl, she is um, very young, she is not 20. So, this uh, woman has uh, come to Mr. Laurie to uh, seek his assistance in recovering somebody who is very, very important to her. And uh, she is perplexed, she is confused and that is indicated uh, uh, through the appearance of her forehead. Uh, look at the way the narrator describes it. Uh, uh, the narrator says that the, mm, there is a knitting going on uh, in her forehead and once again the word knitting is very uh, important to remember because we will see one other female character who is literally knitting constantly, obsessively and uh, we need to find out in terms of uh, the record that she is trying to keep. So, uh, knitting is an important uh, element uh, that is happening in the novel and symbolically that kind of knitting is uh, indicated in the uh, forehead of Miss Minute who is perplexed by um, the state of affairs she finds herself in. She is also uh, possessing a lot of emotions which is not clearly one particular thing. She, uh, it is a combination of confusion, of wonder, of alarm uh, and at the same time she is also very uh, acutely observing uh, the environment around her. So, uh, Miss Minette is a figure who evokes a lot of empathy on the part of um, the person who is next to her as well as uh, from the readers. This is what uh, Mr. Laurie has to say to uh, Miss Manette uh, and I want you to remember the idea of uh, the lack of sentiment uh, within Mr. Laurie, that is what he advertises. He says that I have no sentiment, I have no emotion, I am a man of business. So, he says, Miss Minette, I am a man of business, I have business charge to acquit myself of. In your reception of it, do not heed me any more than if I was a speaking machine. Truly, I am not much else. I will, with your leave, relate to you, Miss, the story of one of her customers. So, Mr. Laurie is trying to 
eliminate any and every kind of emotion from that scene. He doesn't want to strike a connection with this little girl who is clearly helpless, who is confused, who is up, kind of alarmed, who is uh, awestruck by um, the situation she finds herself in. And Mr. Laurie is trying to distance himself. from Miss Manette and we need to make a connection uh, here between uh, Mr. Laurie's professed sentiment and the uh, connection that kind of attitude has with Telson's bank itself. They are trying to be very very professional that is the theory. So there is also an assumption that professionalism means uh, the uh, desire to weed out any kind of personal relationships. Um, even though this is the uh, desire of Mr. Laurie as well as the desire of Telson's bank, we can see clearly through the way the novel unravels that both Mr. Laurie and Telson's bank do perform a lot of personal service towards their uh, customers. So that's one aspect we need to remember. But coming to this particular excerpt, um, he says that I'm a man of business, don't expect any kind of personal assistance. Uh, and he says that I'm just going to tell you the story of one of our customers. And uh, the other uh, phrase that I want you to pay attention here is, um, the speaking machine, uh, this phrase indicates once again the lack of uh, human element uh, in the uh, dialogue, in the conversation that's going to uh, happen between the two. So uh, he says that don't even consider me as a human being, think of me as a speaking machine who has a job to perform, a business charge to acquit to uh, uh, deliver, to perform to um, satisfaction and, and nothing else and not much else. So this is the theory that Mr. Lowry constantly uh, spouts but as the novel progresses we will see that he tries to uh, bring in the personal element too. So uh, we need not be taken in by uh, the claims, uh, the superficial attitudes thrown about by certain characters. So there is a difference between surface and depth, which again is one other uh, theme that we should constantly pay attention to. So what exactly is Mr. Jarvis Laurie's business? His business relates to a customer called uh, Dr. Minette, uh, he is a doctor from Beauvais, a, a place in France and this doctor is believed to be dead um, so far but in fact he had been imprisoned for 18 long years. Uh, uh, this matter is quite unknown to many and now there is information uh, received by uh, Mr. Lowry that he has been released from uh, prison and uh, in other words we can consider that as being recalled to life. So this is the matter which had been preoccupying Mr. Lowry during his uh, travel to Dover in the mail coach. And that is the message he offers to Jerry, recall to life and that message is delivered to Mademoiselle, uh, Miss Minette uh, and she has come to meet Mr. Lowry with regard to this business of recovering somebody who has been um, considered to be dead um, or buried. So this is the secret service that uh, Mr. Lowry is advised to take upon himself by Telson and Co for the benefit of one of its customers, Dr. Manette. And he says to, uh, uh, to Ms. Manette that she is not supposed to mention the subject, better not mention the subject anywhere or in any way and to remove him for a while at all events out of France. Even I, safe as an Englishman and even Telsons, important as they are to French credit, avoid all naming of the matter. 
I carry about me not a scrap of writing openly referring to it. This is a secret service altogether. So this excerpt clearly tells us that the job that uh, Mr. Laurie is going to perform is uh, of a very confidential uh, character and he says that even mentioning it to several people will bring danger to him and to those who mention it. So he says that don't uh, talk about it to anybody and uh, not in England, not in France, even though I am a member of Telson's bank uh, in France, it's, it's uh, not ideal to uh, mention it uh, anywhere. And he says that I don't carry even a piece of writing which refers to this secret service. And um, what is significant about uh, this excerpt here is the reference to a scrap of writing. He says that um, this uh, job that I'm going to undertake is not written down. It's, it's not in a piece of paper. And um, this novel tells us that uh, writings uh, become evidence, letters become evidence. And that evidence will uh, bring some kind of danger and downfall to uh, some of the people involved in it. So writing is suppressed. So this is the message that uh, he has to offer to Miss uh, Minette. This is the secret service. So even though he's an Englishman, even though he's a banker, even though France has a, a branch of Telsons, even though Telson is important to Fr the French nation, uh, despite all these uh, significances, uh, the man that they're going to save uh, is, uh, uh, is part of a job that w might bring about a lot of uh, danger to those who want to help him. Now, once uh, Miss Minette um, hears about all the details which relate to her father, because that's the man they are going to recover from uh, a place in France, she is uh, struck by the suddenness of all the personal revelations and uh, she is um, fainting. And once she faints, uh, we have a new character who just uh, comes in upon them and uh, uh, helps uh, Miss Manette. So that is uh, represented in that uh, illustration by Harry Furness. And the illustration was done in 1910 for an edition of the novel. So this is Mr. Laurie. And this is Miss Manette. And this is uh, Miss Pross, who is a kind of a maid and a chaperone for uh, Miss Manette. So when uh, Laurie gives her a lot of information, uh, the daughter understands that the father is no longer in prison but has been released and uh, he is right now in the um, home of a man called Defarge uh, uh, who runs an inn, a wine shop in uh, St. Antoine. So all these information are provided to her by Mr. Laurie and she is uh, struck by it and she spoons and Miss uh, Pross who is fiercely protective of um, Miss Minette whom she calls Ladybird intervenes and shouts at um, the banker and at other people and calls for help. Now, let's look at the chapter called The Wine Shop, a place of business run by the Defages. And uh, at the beginning of this chapter, we see a big cask of wine breaking and uh, the wine spills onto the street and the wine runs everywhere. And that is the premise of this particular chapter. And the people uh, in the streets run out and try to drink the wine uh, in um, all kinds of manner. And we get a sense that they are uh, deprived of food. They do not enjoy any of the comforts of life. Um, they are uh, a hungry lot. And uh, even when the wine is spilt on the ground, they do not want to let it uh, go to waste and try to consume it. Men, women, and even children are um, given uh, whatever wine that could be collected from the uh, muddy floors of um, France. 
and this is what um, the narrator has to say about some of the people who uh, very hungrily consume uh, the drink. Those who had been greedy with the staves of the cask had acquired a tigerish smear about the mouth and one tall joker so besmirched his head more out of a long squalid bag of a nightcap than in it, scrawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine lease blood. So when the people tried to drink um, the wine from uh, wherever they could uh, get it out, they assume a kind of a tigerish smear because of the blood that gets um, uh, stuck on their face. Uh, their faces are all stained by this uh, reddish color uh, drink and uh, one man who is so stained by uh, the wine that is uh, flowing on the streets um, is trying to write this word uh, called blood on a wall and he uses his finger uh, to write on the wall and he dips the finger into muddy wine and uh, does this action. That is a very, very symbolic action in the story. And we are uh, easily able to see the uh, figurative association between wine and blood. And there is a suggestion that one day, uh, not in the distant uh, future, blood will flow in the streets of France. So that kind of foreshadowing is also performed in this particular scene. Now, uh, there is also a, another uh, important assumption that we need to pay attention to. Uh, the person who is uh, writing this particular word is also uh, likely to be the one or people like him are the likely set of people to uh, kind of um, spill blood in the streets of, of France. So, those are the symbolic messages that this scene is trying to commit. And when he does write this word, uh, blood on the wall, we have the wine shop owner Defarge come and intervene and ask him not to do it. Uh, he says that why can't you write it elsewhere, preferably write that word on your heart rather than on the wall because that will be noticed by the authorities and that and then there will be trouble. So, um, this is a very symbolic chapter, a chapter that needs to be read and reread. As I mentioned uh, a while ago, there is a lot of hunger among the peasants of France. Hunger was prevalent everywhere, people were starving, there was not enough food to go around and um, in this chapter uh, Dickens personifies hunger, hunger becomes uh, men and women, hunger becomes a figure that uh, stared down from the smokeless chimneys and stared down from the filthy street that had uh, no offal uh, among, the refu among its refuse of anything to eat. So, hunger becomes a human being uh, that is uh, looking down from chimneys which do not smoke because there is no food cooked and, um, and hunger tries to find out if there is anything to eat among the rubbish that is lying about uh, that is flowing in the uh, gutters of the countryside. So, there is nothing to be had and it is in this context that the uh, uh, breaking of a wine cask uh, which um, lets uh, out a lot of wine into the street becomes um, significant. It, in one sense, it um, offers the people something to drink for free. Um, that is uh, one interpretation. The other interpretation is that um, symbolically, um, people will uh, consume the blood of um, society in the future because they have had um, nothing to uh, satiate themselves with. Then this chapter, the wine shop also offers a, a kind of a, a fabric uh, which uh, kind of tells us that uh, this is an important location in the narrative of A Tale of Two Cities and uh, the way the uh, ambience is described also once again metaphorically tells us that uh, um, it is the, it's the uh, um, perceptions of the people that uh, fills the air of Saint Antoine. 
the narrator says that in the hunted air of the people there was yet some wild beast thought of the possibility of turning at bay. So even um, the air of Saint Antoine communicates this message that uh, at, w at one point of time uh, the wild beast uh, in the people uh, in the countryside will uh, turn to attack its pursuers. There will come a time when the hunted will turn to hunt the people who have been hunting them so far. So um, the moment for retribution will come, the moment for vengeance will come, the moment for taking revenge will come on the part of the peasants, the hungry, the uh, underprivileged. For the time was to come when the gaunt scarecrows of that region should have watched the lamp lighter in their idleness and hunger so long as to conceive the idea of improving on this method and hauling up men by those ropes and police to flare upon the darkness of their condition. But the time was not come yet, and every wind that blew over France shook the rags of the scarecrows in vain, for the birds, fine of song and feather, took no warning. This excerpt is also very important because uh, there is a symbolic connection that is being drawn between uh, the activity of lighting a lamp uh, using ropes and pulleys and uh, the concept of the guillotine which will also work um, with the help of ropes and pulleys. But while uh, in the one case lamps are being lit, in the other cases uh, lights of human beings are uh, shut out in a very horrific and brutal manner. So um, the narrator tries to tell us that uh, the people, uh, the peasants of um, France have become inspired or are beginning to uh, become inspired by the uh, concept of lamp lighting and because of the uh, straightened circumstances because of the brutality that they are undergoing on a daily basis uh, they will come to discover the concept of the guillotine which will uh, haul up haul up men by those ropes and pulleys and uh, it will hang people and that death will light up uh, the darkness of the condition. People who are privileged, people who have exploited and the peasants will die deaths uh, by hanging by the guillotine and their deaths will light up the uh, darkness of the condition of the peasantry. So, but that time has not come yet. It's not time yet for that time to come, for the revolution to come and every wind that blew over France shook the uh, rags of the scarecrows in vain. The scarecrows are the peasants, the people who have nothing um, to live by. And uh, the reference to birds of fine song and feather are the reference to the aristocrats who will pay dearly um, when the time for the revolution has come. And uh, the narrator tells us that uh, the aristocrats have not uh, taken any kind of warning uh, from the state of affairs that is uh, oppressing the rural regions of France. This is the physical description uh, of uh, the farge illustrated by Harry Furness uh, in the year 1910. So this is a 20th uh, century description and uh, Defarge is a burly man and he looks very confident. He has his overcoat um, slung on one side and he has a, a, a you know a very uh, piercing set of eyes and curly hair and uh, he is uh, not somebody you want to meet with in a uh, dark alley. So that impression is conveyed through this illustration of Harry Furness. Now let's look at the textual description of Defarge the wine shop keeper. The wine shop keeper was a bull necked martial looking man of 30 and he should have been of a hot temperament for although it was a bitter day he wore no coat but carried one slung over his shoulder good humored looking on the whole but implacable looking too evidently a man of a strong resolution and a set purpose 
a man not desirable to be met rushing down a narrow pass with a gulf on either side for nothing would turn the man so we can get a list of specific characteristics about defarge um, a description that will um, put the fear of god in the person who is looking at him so he is a man who is physically very tough and that sense is given by this um, illustration too tough hardy and he it looks like he is a man who is ready for a fight and he looks hot tempered too um, quick to become angry and um, the narrator says that even though it is a cold day he is not wearing his coat uh, that tells him that uh, the harsher elements of nature is not having any impact on his uh, physique and um, he looks good humored on the whole uh, at the surface you know uh, he does not seem as if he is uh, threatening but he is also very implacable you cannot uh, make him compromise he is not going to change his mind uh, he is a man of strong resolution and a set purpose he has a definite aim in life and you do not want to meet him um, on a narrow path because he will not turn for you he will not make a you know concessions for the other so this in, uh, description is very significant because it gives a very fair idea of the kind of man uh, mr defarge the owner of the wine shop is now let's look at the qualities um, physical and emotional of madame defarge his wife Madame Defarge is a key character in a tale of two cities and I would say that she is a foil to Miss Minette and I would like you to make a comparison between the physical description of Miss Minette and Madame Defarge and you will see that um, there is a binary element uh, to this uh, pair of characters in the novel each of them signifying something that is uh, distinct that is very very polar to one another she is uh, madame jafage is a stout woman of about his own age uh, about 30 years of age uh, with a watchful eye that seldom seemed to look at anything a large heavily ringed a steady face strong features and great composure of manner there was a character about madame defarge from which one might have predicted that she did not often make mistakes against herself in any of the reckonings over which she presided madame defarge being sensitive to cold was wrapped in fur and had a quantity of bright shawl twinned about her head though not the concealment of her large earrings her knitting was before her but she had laid down to pick her teeth with a toothpick it's a wonderful uh, paragraph in the sense that it tells you a, a variety of uh, interesting things about uh, this woman she is um, more or less of the same age as her husband uh, mr defarge and um, while Mr. Defarge, he is not affected by cold, so he is not wearing his coat. Uh, but Madame Defarge um, is wearing a lot of stuff. She has uh, uh, wrapped herself because um, she does uh, feel a lot of um, cold. And there is a reference to that aspect here, Madame Defarge being sensitive to cold. So we do get a lot of differences between the husband and the wife and, and that is something to be noticed because um, as the novel progresses we will see how they converge uh, in terms of certain significant political affairs and how they uh, come to a stage towards the end of the novel where they become divergent uh, uh, politically. So um, these descriptive uh, markers are important in that regard. So while the husband is not wearing uh, a coat and um, this woman is wrapped in fur uh, what does that tell us about madame defarge it tells us that she is rich at least she's very comfortable financially 
the fact that she can wear fur and I would like you to contrast uh, Madame Defarge's um, clothing uh, with the uh, kind of clothes the other people, the peasants of France um, put on themselves. Now let's look at other aspects. She is very watchful, she does have a watchful eye, but she does not look at anything uh, um, you know in particular, she does not seem to look at anything in particular. So, it is a very uh, sly uh, manner that she has in observing uh, things. She is watchful, but she, you cannot watch her watching anything in particular uh, and that quality is something that we need to keep in mind about Madame Defarge. She is quietly observant and she ha has a lot of rings on her uh, hands and she is heavily ringed once again suggesting that she is very uh, wealthy, financially very comfortable. And again she has strong features like her husband set features with definite purpose, but then she is also very composed and this composure whom does it uh, remind you of? Can you tell? There is a similarity with regard to composure with Mr. Lorry, who is also very composed, very sedate, very measured. So, um, there is also a, a point in the novel when um, illustrations of Madame Defarge are can be compared to the illustrations of Mr. Lorry. So, she is similar to the banker in that regard and another point of similarity is the fact that both of them are accountants of one kind or another. Mr. Lorry is a banker whereas Madame Dufarge is the one who sits at the till uh, of her shop, the wine shop. She is the one who does the accounts, she calculates the money that has come into the shop and the narrator says that she did not often make mistakes against herself in any of the accounts that she does. So, she is a woman who does not make mistakes that is also something that we need to keep in mind. She is almost uh, nearly perfect in that regard and there is also a parallel to Mr. Lorry in this matter. And uh, as I mentioned uh, she is uh, uh, slightly rich and that is suggested in the amount of um, you know cloth that is uh, on her, uh, she has a lot of shawls, um, bright shawls, she is wearing bright shawls which are wrapped up uh, about her head too and uh, even though uh, the shawl covers the head, they do not cover the large earrings once again uh, pointing to her uh, financial status and most importantly she knits. She is a woman who is identified by her knitting, she is constantly found to be knitting, but in this case she has put the knitting down and she is picking her teeth with a toothpick. And we need to remember that whatever Madame Defarge does in this novel is significant because they are open to symbolic interpretation. So, at this point she is picking, um, picking her teeth with a toothpick and that may say something about the wine shop to her husband. So, this picking her teeth could also be a code, a, a coded message to her husband that something is different in the wine shop. Thank you for watching, I will continue in the next session.